All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ah, music to my ears. It's so good to have that back. Yes, this is Thinking Biblically. I'm Stephen Anderson, and it is the 10th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. Counting down to his coming. I just don't know what the countdown's at now. But it can't be too far off, especially when people are out there talking about throwing nuclear bombs around. Christ said, unless those days be cut short, no flesh will be saved. So he will cut it short. That his coming is to cut it short before human beings destroy everything. God will not allow that. He will cut it short. I was thinking the other day, I haven't looked into this. I had to look into it a little bit more. But it seems to me, you know, in the book of Revelation, we have the, uh, the, the beast with seven heads. And then there's an eighth that is of the seven. Seems to me that. That, that reminds me of the G7 and the 8th, which is of the 7, but unlike the 7, but it's of the 7, which is the, the, the EU, Vander Lion. Because the EU isn't really a country, and it's not a kingdom. But yet... <clears throat> I can remember when they were going to, everybody was speculating, not everybody, but people that were following prophecy were speculating that, that the EU might be that. And when it gets to 10, 10 horns, well, horns are powers. Uh, uh, the heads are, are kingdoms. The scripture says these are seven uh, kings. So I know there's traditional trans, uh, renderings of that. We need to keep our our eschatology a bit open uh, lest we miss it when it takes place oh i thought it was going to happen that way you mean lord you had a different idea than me oh my yeah uh, i know when i said that we are already in tribulation people got upset they said no oh, no we haven't been raptured yet <laughs> well if you're raptured you're no longer in tribulation Tribulation. The church has always been in tribulation. Jesus promised it. In this world, you will have tribulation. But fear not, I've overcome this world. Yeah. So uh, now I didn't think say we were in the great tribulation, but I, I think I I have you know I think we're in the great apostasy. And I heard somebody the other day. I think it might have been James White that said we're in the great apostasy. Yeah. I mean, what? Aren't you paying attention? I mean, it's, it's been going on for a while, but it keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, so, I know James White, I don't know what his eschatology is. He's in a mess. But anyway, uh, before I get on to other things, I was looking quickly through the comments, and I happened one caught my eye. I don't know why. And let's see, where is that? Uh, oh, here. Okay, there's a comment a couple months ago. I think it had to do with a comment I made about uh, probably the 4th of July and uh, idolatry, the worship of the flag, perhaps the American flag. I made, made a comment that I, I have an American flag, a, a Christian flag for my house instead of the American flag. Yeah, after the last election, I had one up for a while during the 2020 election, but when Biden won, it came down. <laughs> But I think a lot of people that in, in this area of the country, east central, rural Illinois, pretty much rural, uh, there's a lot of Christian flags around the small community, or not Christian flags, American flags around the small communities. I think it's sort of like, and once in a while you'll see a Confederate flag. But I think it's, it is sort of like the Confederate flag that to put the, the American flag up now 
is really a, an act of defiance to Washington. <laughs> you know, we still believe in <laughs> Yeah, but uh, my loyalty is to Christ. I mean, th this country, all, all these countries are only temporary. The United States is only temporary. It's not the kingdom of God. And my loyalty is to Christ. It's, it's been since I was born again. Yeah, he's, 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 he's where my allegiance lies. So that's why I have an American flag up. And somebody that, who calls himself absolute predestination Christian <laughs> commented two months ago, there is no Christian flag. It is man-made tradition. Well, so is the doctrine of absolute predestination. <laughs> So is Calvinism. It's human tradition, human philosophy. It's not the Scripture. As I've demonstrated in the past, looking up the proofs in the Westminster Confession for absolute predestination of all things, and the Bible doesn't say what they say it says there. Now, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm an agnostic on that. I mean, I don't want to go beyond what Scripture says, especially in something like that. Because the consequences of God predestining absolutely everything in exhaustive detail makes God necessarily the author of every wickedness there is. You know, there's really sort of a pagan um, idea where you have the, the, the one, the one, you know, like the force. Uh, and it's not, it's not a biblical idea. It, you cannot justify that from Scripture alone. It derives from pagan philosophy. It derives from Aristotle and his kind. Uh, his ideas of God, uh, the, in fact, I've got a video uploading right now on the war uh, in the Reformed Baptist camp because uh, I happened to see it. YouTube threw it at me this morning, and I looked at that and said, oh, that's what that why they've labeled James White a heretic has to do with the doctrine of the simplicity of God. Now, apparently you're not allowed to say, uh, I'd like a, a scriptural basis for things. James White made that mistake, so he got labeled a heretic because he doesn't follow what Aquinas says. It's really a simple issue. You know, it has to do with with the uh, the attributes of God and whether there, uh, all the attributes are equal in God. And apparently, Aquinas says something like that. I don't haven't read his quote, but uh, yeah, they're, of course they're equal in God because they're simply God. They're simply God. That's his. You can't break God up and separate. But we view them from a human perspective, and we use different words to describe God, like love, justice, holiness, omnipotence, and apparently. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Aquinas said something. Like, well, that's they're all simply one in God. Well, it's, yeah, they're all God. <laughs> Those are just descriptive uh, descriptive terms we apply to God to describe Him. They're just words. <laughs> God's essence isn't broken up, and He doesn't have a compartment of love and a compartment of wrath and a compartment of omnipotence. And He's not composed of all the doctrine of simplicity. Says. And if you just leave it there, you're okay, because everybody can get this. God is not made up out of parts. He's not an assembly of pieces. He is one essence. Trinitarian Christianity has always said God is one essence or one substance and three persons, although that comes from the Latin persona, which does not mean what it means in English. Persona means like a mask. And we don't want to go there because that almost goes to, this is, see, this is a problem with languages. Uh, and, and Latin, not Greek. Now, the Greek church does not use the word persona. They use hypostasis, which literally means that which is under. So, uh, persona in the Latin, if I remember right, means like a mask. So, but that sounds like uh, almost oneness Pentecostalism, where you have uh, um, God, I forgot the term they use, but basically he appears as, as uh, the Son, or he appears as the Father, or he appears as the Spirit. He just... 
but it's, he's not actually. These things are not permanent; they're just an appearance he takes on. Uh, that that's not historic Christian orthodoxy. So, describing the Trinity is tricky. You're, no matter what you say, you're probably going to get in trouble. Because we're limited, we're not, we're not, we're not God. But anyway, I got a comment here. Absolute predestination, Christian says there is no Christian flag. It is a man-made tradition. Of course, what isn't? Other than everything God's revealed. Uh, your church is a man-made tradition. The church building, pews, or well, I don't know. Can you can you call stack chairs a tradition, or or just garbage? You know, yeah, we want our church to look like a, a conference hall. Um, uh, communion plates are a tradition. Uh, uh, whether you have a separate cup or individual cups or a single cup, whether you worship on Sunday morning or not, it, you know, the, the early church met early on Sunday morning, the first day of the week, but that is not a commandment. It's a tradition. It's passed down. Now, a lot of traditions aren't passed down very far. But, yeah, of course it's a man-made thing. It's a man-made symbol. What does a symbol say? Why do I have it in the flagpole for my house instead of American flag? I'm declaring that my allegiance is to Jesus Christ. It's got a cross on it. It's got blue on it and white and red. And that was supposed to symbolize different things. Of course, it's not divinely revealed. There's a lot of things that aren't. Organs aren't divinely revealed, and pianos aren't divinely revealed, and psalms are not man are not actually in the New Testament. <laughs> you know, one of the problems with singing psalms is they were not written in Greek or English. It just doesn't work very well. The the Psalter. You know, the, the attempt to put it in English, uh, it just doesn't do justice. It doesn't. <laughs> there is no commandment to say, thou shalt only sing psalms. Well, they should only sing them in Hebrew because they're a lot better in Hebrew than they are in, in English or Greek. Uh, you have to leave too many words out to make, to make them rhyme, you know. In fact, I sort of wonder, I, I was thinking, I just thought of... Uh, a Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Of course, it was originally, originally written in late med medieval German. So how, how different is it in German compared to English? You know? How well can you translate those things? But yeah, so is that really, there is no Christian flag. It is a man-made tradition. Is it, what kind of an objection is that? I don't know. So I was curious, of course, and I decided I've got to look up this guy, absolute predestination Christian. So I was, it's always a possibility. Not that he really annoyed me because I, I don't, I'm not going to get upset about stuff like this. But I thought, well, I wonder what videos he's got here. Uh, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, here's one. Uh, God loves only the elect and hates the rest of the human race. Is that true? Is that true? Now, it depends what you mean by love and hate. Now, uh, let's let's go to the scriptures and see this is one of the re uh, the things that sort of uh, caused me to reconsider Calvinism. 1 Timothy 2:4. Or at least limited atonement. This caused me to reject uh, down the path of rejecting limited atonement. Now, the atonement, maybe I'll get into that, uh, has l elements of, uh, or particular redemption, if you prefer that term, it has elements of particular redemption, but it also has elements of universal, because creation itself will be redeemed. And it was redeemed on the cross. It is finished. It just, it just hasn't been manifested yet just like we haven't been glorified yet. In fact, the redemption of creation, according to Paul, awaits the glorification of the sons of God, which means there must be a millennial kingdom. Besides, Jesus said of the wine, of the, the, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. 
Huh. So it can't be all floating around up in heaven playing harps. <laughs> Wine is a physical thing on earth, right? Uh, the kingdom of God will be on earth. Christ will return physically as he departed. Now, if you want to go all Augustinian on me, I'll simply say Augustine was not an apostle. So, uh, 1 Timothy 2.4 who, that is God, will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And I remember listening to uh, Calvinists like James White, who purport to be experts in biblical Greek, since he taught it. And uh, actually, I think he got his stuff from the polemics of uh, John Owen on his uh, Death of Death and the Death of Christ. That book is not a book of the atonement of the cross is simply polemics arguing for particular redemption. That's all it is. It's a polemical book. It's sort of like uh, Turretin's, uh, what is it? Institutes of Atlantic Theology. It's nothing but polemics. So here we see this video, Does God Hate Sinners? God loves only his elect and hates the rest of humanity. Well, why does he say, and why does Paul write then to Timothy, who desires all men to be saved? And the argument of the Calvinists is, or the are those Calvinists that that believe that the atonement is only for the elect, in all ways, only for the intention of God in the cross was only to redeem the elect. Now there are elect that are still sinners, right? That haven't been saved yet, haven't even been born yet. Uh, so, but let's look at it. In the Greek, the form of all men, pontus anthropos, hos pontus anthropos, indicates that it indeed is all men because, let's see, what is the issue here? You got a relative pronoun and then pontus anthropos. It de there it depends on the presence or absence of the definite article. When it is in the form, this is a technical argument. The Holy Spirit happened to direct me to the column on the right that's over my head right here in regard to this particular text right here. And it just happened to show up in Gingrich up here. Let's see, I can do that by over, going over here. Pontas is the word in question. All. Pontas anthropos. Poi, paus, pos. Is all men. Okay? Now, the argument is, because of the context... Paul is talking about all kinds of men. And indeed, all the Greek all men, Pontus Anthropos, can mean all kinds. Or it can mean all men inclusively. All types of men, all categories of men, or all men. So what does it mean? Does the grammar tell us anything? Well, some Greek experts like James White were saying, we're typically ignoring the fact, you sort of wonder, if did he actually teach Greek. So it, it has over here in Gingrich's, uh, maybe if I take myself out of the picture, it'll help. I wasn't planning on getting into this, but hey, why not? Uh, <clears throat> Pontas. Okay. Now, pas, pasa pan. You've probably heard that from James White. And he makes this his argument about all. It says, one, adjective used with a noun, uh, A, with a noun in the singular. Okay, what, what do we have here? We have the noun, anthropos. What is that in? That is in the plural, all men. So it's not uh, with a noun in the singular. Uh, 
So a doesn't apply. So we have to, with a noun in the plural, without the article. Pontes anthropoi. Pontes anthropoi. So it, with a noun, anthropos, or plural here is anthropoi, which because it's in the plural, it's just not in the uh, in the same case, but otherwise it's identical. So uh, let me turn myself back on. <laughs> Where is that? There it is. Okay. So here, this this is it. She wants to keep moving on me, so I have to uh, here. Here we go. So. So it's not a, it's not a, uh, the pontus with a singular noun. So we have to go down to B, with a noun in the plural without the article, because this one doesn't have the, the definite article in front, and that's the only kind of article there is. Uh, pontes anthropoi, that would be in the, um, uh, not the accusative, the, uh, the, the subject, not the uh, um, object of the sentence. So that's what we've got here. We have, pom, pom, this is probably in the genitive rather than the, uh, but that's not relative. It's what the noun in plural with pontas, pontes, without the definite article. There is no de indefinite article. There is the, but no a in Greek. Okay, so it means in this form, all people, everyone. So to say it refers to categories of people is not correct. That's a different form. That would be, I think, in uh, the singular. Yes, in the singular. A up here, when you have it in the singular without the article, it can mean, um, I think, let me say. Every kind of, all sorts of. That's in the singular without the article. This is in the plural without the ar article. So it means all, all men. So that whole argument that James White and others have probably picked up by, from somebody like John Owen is grammatically incorrect. It does indeed mean all men. So you can't say, well, the argument is from the context. Well, what, kind, what is God talking about? He's talking about kings and those in authority. He's talking about all kinds of men, not all men, right? No, he's talking about all men. <laughs> now, the, 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 the context up above, let's um, look to that a little bit here. Now, it says, I exhort, first of all, that, all pr uh, that, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and those in authority, that we may lead a quiet, and peaceable life and all. Uh, let me look at something. I, I'm just curious. Let me look at this verse to see what form it's in. Made for all men. Pontus. No, it's, all, it's plural also. So it's the same. So it needs all men. It doesn't mean all kinds of men. It means all men. <laughs> I was wondering if the form changed. No, it didn't. For kings and all... See, even for kings that are persecuting you. How do you pray for Biden? I, you know, This is how I pray for Biden. Because I don't know how to pray for Biden. And people like Biden. God's enemies. I pray this way, thy will be done. Because I don't know what God should do with them. I don't know what God's will is for Joe Biden. Because I'm not God. 
I'm not his judge. God judges the world. The church doesn't judge the world. God judges the world. We judge in the church. He's not in the church. He's a manifest sinner. He's not in the church. Even if he claims to be, he's not. Even if he frequents, uh, goes and visits the Antichrist in Rome, that doesn't make him a Christian. So uh, <laughs> that would identify him as not a Christian, wouldn't you think? Uh, he's going to have a private conversation with Antichrist. Yes, and the Pope in Rome is an Antichrist. He opposes Christ. He takes the place of Christ. Anti in, anti in, Antichristos in Greek means both in place of, like Vicarius Christi, a substitute for Christ, and against. It can be used in either way, or both ways. So, all men means all men in this particular chapter because of the form of the Greek. The plural of the noun and the, adje or the adjective uh, all combined with the lack of a definite article means all men. <clears throat> Why? Why? Because, well... One of the arguments James White was, well, we can't possibly pray for, it, pray for everyone. Sure we can. God's will be done. Grant, grant all repentance and faith uh, whom you desire, to whom you desire. God's will be done. You know, there's no reason uh, to believe that God uh, has elected everyone. I don't know. But that God is—this is the way— uh, R.C. Sproul mentioned this, and I thought he was sort of whipping out on it, but he said God, God is inclined toward the salvation of all men. In other words, God is not uh, doing anything to prevent them from being saved. There, there's a distinction. There is. It may be a bit subtle, but if, you abs if you're absolute predestinarian, it's eh. Now, all Calvinists aren't. Um, Francis Schaeffer uh, referred to uh, God's election and stuff and will as like, like a road. There's a ditch on both sides. and then the, But you got free. It's like I've, I've uh, explained it as uh, uh, the, the, the interstate highway system. You know, there's on-ramps and off-ramps, but uh, in between you're predestined <laughs> unless you decide to go off-road. Uh, you're, you say if you take the interstate from where I am and you take it west, you're predestined to get to Champaign-Urbana because that's where it goes. If you're on the narrow way, if you've entered through the narrow gate and you're on the narrow way, you're predestined to salvation because you're in the way, you're in Christ. Now, if you're taking the broad way, what are you predestined to? Destruction. Because that's where that road goes. Can't, is there an off-ramp, an on-ramp? Well, there's something called repentance. Now, if you want to talk about the eternal decree of God, well, I'm going to say, show it to me in the Scripture, the, the e eternal, exhaustive decree of all things. Are you getting it from Scripture, or are you getting it from man's reason and pagan philosophy? which is what I traced it back to. Aristotle's ideas of God's perfection, what you end up with is a God who is blind and deaf and dumb and cannot possibly be aware of human beings because he can't change at all, including his knowledge. And not only that, that you've got to have a God that is predestined himself. God is not free to do anything, either. It can, God can't possibly interact with man. He can't, because that would involve change. Of course, you'd think that, that God becoming flesh and dwelling among us might constitute some kind of a change in God, too, wouldn't you? Now, it doesn't constitute a change in his nature, his being. Exactly. <laughs> but... Uh, it certainly would constitute a change in his, his, well, 
God has added humanity to himself. That I think that's a pretty... To, 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 to be able to confess that Jesus Christ is indeed God and man um, and say that there's no change at all in God of any kind, it's like, really? Prove that. See, they, they go back to their basic uh, metaphysics that they get from Aristotle. It can't be because Aristotle said this. Or Augustine. I don't care if it was Augustine or Aristotle. Where did Augustine get it? See, this goes back to logic, and logic is only a way of thinking. Start with false premises, and you get false conclusions. That's predestination. You start with false premises, and you're predestined to come to a false conclusion by right thinking about your false premise. <laughs> All right, so I hope that helps somebody out there. So if you got somebody that, you know, the the problem the problem I ran to into with Calvinism Calvinism is a, is right on a lot of things okay, but on uh, the absolute predestination of all things you you, know, you cannot avoid coming up with God as the uh, the the op, the the, uh, the cause of all sin, all sin the immediate cause he predestines it that's the that's the real cause. Uh, however you want to define that in the metaphysical language, I don't care. It's still God is responsible. Now, does God say that he predestines rapes and everything else? He predestines all sin? Does he say that about himself? You better be able to have a clear statement from multiple locations in the Bible if you're going to make an accusation against God like that. That's the problem. Uh, so you need, if you're going to go pick, use Aristotle as a basis and, and distort some verses to justify that, your theology, it's like, nope, just stick with the Word of God. So you could dump Calvinism as long as you stick with the Word of God. But again, Calvinism is probably right more often than it's wrong. Uh, A lot of ways, it's it's like, and there, the Calvinism is also a broad stream. I mean, in spite of James White, because he's a a high Calvinist, a particular kind of, he's more Calvinistic than Calvin because Calvin seems to indicate a universal atonement. See, you have to have a very narrow idea of God's purposes in the atonement, and that's why this is relevant to what I've been talking about. This is about the atonement of Christ. Uh, the atonement involves the redeeming of creation. And uh, the Scripture, Paul says that, that, that Christ is a Savior of all men, especially or particularly those who believe. So in some sense, God is a Savior of all men. But yet he's only he's a special savior of those who believe. How can that be? Well, you have to look at broader purposes. Uh, God, uh, Christ, by his blood, did he purchase just the elect, or did he purchase all humanity? If you look at what Jesus talks about the judgment, uh, say the judgment of the sheep and the goats, what are they judged on? their keeping of the law, or whether or not they believe in Christ, whether or not they belong to him. What does he say to the, the people that say, oh, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things, wonderful things for you in your name? And he said, I never knew you, you who practice iniquity, lawlessness. I never knew you. So if you're not known by God, you don't belong to him. But those who belong to him are those who exercise faith in Christ. But that doesn't mean he didn't purchase all the world uh, with his blood in a different sense. He could have redeemed everyone from under the law. We're not under the law anymore anyway. And put them under himself. You answer, you're judged basis, based on your relationship to Christ, not on your relationship to Moses including the Jews, all you dispensationalists. 
Uh, now that I'd have to go into more detail on that, but I think you can get that from the scriptures, from Paul's epistles, particularly. And again, like like the things that here and there, you get snippets, like Jesus talking about drinking the fruit of the vine new in the kingdom of God. Well, unless you've got it, uh, the kingdom of God is is coming to earth, the rule of Christ on earth. He's talking about real wine. Uh, it's just like uh, Irenaeus in the second century said, there, the, his, uh, he was very strong that there must be a literal fulfillment of the millennium on earth after the return of Christ. See, he's not a post-millennial. He was pre-millennial. In order to fulfill the prophecies, including New Testament prophecies, <clears throat> He has to rule and reign for a thousand years. Rule and reign over what? <laughs> and even in the eschaton, the after at the at the end of the book of Revelation, after the second judgment and the second resurrection, there's a space in between. Now, unless you don't believe it, okay, it's not my problem if you're not going to believe Scripture, but it's your problem. <laughs> But uh, uh, the, the, the kingdom, the, the new Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven to earth, and God makes his home on earth, not in heaven. It's where, for eternally, God has come down and dwells with man. Eternally. Now, see, we have to have an understanding of the Bible, which is sort of what's called theology, that's able to take everything God says and put it together in a harmonious manner. And if your theology can't do it, there's something wrong with your theology. I'll guarantee there's not, nothing wrong with the Word of God. Oh, so anyway, uh, who gave himself as a ransom for all, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Now, this has to be the same all as the all up above, doesn't it? <laughs> to be testified in due time. Ah. <sighs> Okay, so again, you can have a the, the idea only Calvinists, as far as I know, hold to the idea of a limited atonement. Uh, Lutherans don't; they don't buy that. And they're about the closest thing to Calvinists. Uh, typically, Baptists don't. Now, why the idea of a limited atonement is only based on logic. Why? It goes like this. Why would Jesus die for people he's not going to save? And salvation is determined by the eternal decree, according to them. He eternally chose some people for salvation, so why would he waste Christ's blood on others? Well, it's not quantitative anyway. It's not quantitative. Jesus didn't suffer a certain amount and die a certain amount for a certain number of people. He died under the law, fulfilling the punishment of the law. He satisfied the law. He satisfied justice. And the atonement that is in him. It's not separate from him. In order to be saved, you must be in Christ. It's only for those, it, it only is effective for those who are in him. Because the, what he did, as, as the Calvinists usually say, it was sufficient for all, but effective only for the elect. Okay, no problem. It is, Christ's atonement was for all humanity, but it is, it is, a, it is saving only when it's mixed with faith. 
because God has ordained that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. That's what he's decreed, not by works. I'm not saying he hasn't decreed anything else. It's just So, see, there's no contradiction there if you understand things properly. It's a lack of understanding that leads to all kinds of errors. And it's not, you know, the flesh always likes to squirm and try to get out from under it. And that's why, uh, you know, I talk about limited. See, the, the whole argument between in Bible-believing Christians about limited atonement, Calvinist versus non-limited universal atonement, which is everybody else, Uh, somebody's going to bring up some strange Baptist sects like the Primitive Baptists that thought, they say they're not Calvinists, but they are Calvinists. Uh, they held the same kind of theology. Where'd they get it from, Calvin? <laughs> they came along later. But, uh, uh, see, a lot of the arguments we see in the church today, let's say in the Southern Baptists, <laughs> I, I mean among believers, let's <laughs> is, you know, the, the, the particular or limited atonement versus uh, universal. So you have, it's not really a biblical problem. It's just simply a problem with people's understanding. And uh, one of the people that James White cannot stand is uh, a man, a Southern Baptist named David L. Allen, who wrote this book, The Atonement. The Biblical, Theological, and Historical Study of the Cross of Christ. Eh, I'd recommend it. And then he wrote a bigger book that James White just hates. Just hates this book. Just misrepresents this book all the time. David L. Allen, The Extent of the Atonement. A Historical and Critical Review. So he goes back and the history of the views of, of, of you know, the whether it was universal or uh, limited. And then he does a, a, a critical, his personal opinion, critical review, that's personal opinion. I do critical reviews all the time. So here, but the difference is, the real difference, see, this is not a, this is irrelevant. A lot, this whole debate, in, in many ways, is totally irrelevant because it has nothing to do with whether an individual is saved. Uh, uh, it, you know, to, to say God God elects people, of course, the Bible mentions God choosing people for his own purposes. He, there's, it also mentions in Corinthians the kind of people he chooses and the kind of people he generally doesn't. So <clears throat> there's no real problem there. Uh, the 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 arguing about the extent of the atonement is a comes about from misunderstanding the nature of the atonement thinking it's a quantitative thing Jesus suffered so much how many times did Jesus have to die then you got weird things too like people say uh, that Jesus had to die eternally how does that work because that's the punishment for sin no it's not no, it's not the punishment for sin. Death is the punishment for sin. Separation from God. The problem is there's no repentance in hell. You stay there until you repent. You're not going to repent because the Holy Spirit's not going to, God is not going to grant you repentance. You don't want it anyway. That is the ultimate state of uh, of sin and a reprobate mind, where it's just look at the White House. That's what hell's like. These people keep on doing utterly stupid things to themselves and to the rest of us. There's no repentance. Look at Europe committing Harry Carey suicide, cutting themselves from off from their off from their own source of heat for the next winter, this winter. There's no turning back. There's no repentance. No repentance because it's God's judgment. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if, if we get to heaven, so we can, might realize that, hey, these people will get out as soon as they repent, but they're, they're never going to repent because they hate God. 
you got to have a transformation of your heart. They hate God. They don't want to be near God. And uh, God is constantly reminding them they're, they're sinful. See, they're, I think in hell they're not totally, they can't totally escape the presence of God. And to be even remotely in the presence of God for a sinner would be absolute torture. Would it not? You know, it talks about, in, in, in the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, the sea of glass mixed with fire. Well, fire is cleansing and judgment, cleansing. A fire does not get along with things that are combustible. <laughs> so it, it's holiness. You can look at it, God's holiness, God's righteousness, God's justice, and God's mer uh, love, too. And uh, it be, it's, they're not really separable. And you have to be his and conform to the image of Christ to abide in the constant burning. It, then it's like, take it. Get rid I, you know, the idea that Paul talks about they'll be saved as through fire. The, the, the things of the flesh, all the, the nonsense is going to be consumed. And we're all going to say, amen, take it away. So that the whole, the whole argument uh, that's raging between limited and universal atonement is really nonsense far as I, I can understand. Okay, now, on the atonement itself, which is the real issue. D here's the real issue. This is what we should be waging war about, is against those who say that Christ didn't die and take the punishment for our sins. I never heard of such a thing. You know, but yeah, there are people out there that believe that, as I've discovered to my chagrin. Well, I knew there was people like that, but you wouldn't expect to find them around you. <laughs> you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or people like that. But you wouldn't expect to find them in, in Christian churches. Well, yes, you do. But I would have to say that if you, hold, if you don't hold to penal substitutionary atonement, Christ vicariously... Uh, dying as our substitute, taking our punishment, the, the death that was due us upon himself, you're not a Christian. It's not a, there's, That's a red line. That is about the biggest red line there is. You know, it hardly matters if you accept the fact he died and rose again if he didn't die for your sins. What did he die for then? Well, like the, the governmental... Uh, uh, theory of the atonement says he died as a demonstration that God takes sin seriously. I, I cannot think of anything so asinine as that as that idea of the atonement because what it's saying is is God sent his son into the world who was completely free and innocent of sin and then executed his own son as a demonstration of God's justice? How is that justice? It only makes sense if Christ came, voluntarily laid down his life as a substitutionary sacrifice, as the Lamb of God, take, bearing our punishment in order that God might satisfy his justice, his law, his very nature, and then is free to deal with us in mercy and grace and love, because our sin was a problem for God. How can a just and holy God forgive and save sinners? Everybody that tries to get self-salvation, you don't realize the problem. And the governmental theory destroys the atonement. Um, the sub the, uh, the uh, substitution of the debt theory is close to the, like, uh, it's 
Eh, it's a little weak. But see, these, these other things you could say, uh, like the uh, Christus Victus and even the governmental theory, as a subsidiary element to the main purpose of the atonement, which is Christ's substitutionary death. But that has to be the main. Otherwise, you end up with no salvation at all. No, you're still in your sins. People that hold to the governmental view and say that's what Christ died for and reject penal substitution like, like uh, uh, Kenneth Greider, the Nazarene, who is now dead, and you, you, you reject penal substitution? You've rejected what Christ did for you. You've got no salvation. You have no gospel. You're no more saved than a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. See, if you deny the cross, well, look at Galatians. Add one work, add one commandment, and you've cut yourself off from Christ. Well, denying the, the, the whole, his death, uh, the purpose of his substitutionary death, how much more that cuts you off from Christ. See, this is an absolutely critical issue, and we cannot minimize it. Anyway, uh, you know, you've got people like Roger Olson that says, well, I prefer the governmental view to penal substitution. Uh, well, tell that to the father. I, I don't like the idea that you sent your son into the world to die for my sins. I don't think that's just. So I prefer this lame, worthless theory that you executed your own son just to demonstrate you take sin seriously. Well, God already demonstrated that, like the global flood of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah and, well, all kinds of natural disasters that he says he causes. I notice that Nazarenes don't believe that. They don't believe that. The... Uh, what do they call it? Natural evil. God doesn't do those things, they say. God says he does those things. When he t sends a hurricane into the Gulf Coast, he says, I do that. Causes an earthquake? I do that. Sends a tornado? I do that. God owns it. W when somebody rapes someone, God doesn't say, I do that. moral evil. Obviously he permits it because people can do it. Which means if God doesn't predestine it and people do it, then who's responsible? Man or God? If God predestines it in exhaustive detail, then who's responsible? God. Yeah, that's the difference. Now, I happen to notice there's one thing about having a shelf full of reference books. You find out these references. Somebody's making a comment on something and they refer to somebody's. Oh, I've got that book. This is a new, a new Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith by Dr. Robert uh, Raymond. Now I lost my page. Oh, man. Dummy. Now I've, now I've got to look it up again. <laughs> so, uh, index of subjects. G, where's G? G, 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 G. God, 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 God. Get lots of gods. Governmental theory, 474. Yeah, I'm close. Okay, anyway, uh, he actually he actually responds to Kenneth, uh, J. Kenneth Grider's book in here. Conveniently so. So let's see what uh, Dr. Robert Raymond, who's Calvinistic, semi-moderate though I'd say, uh, on this. He sums up his he he talks about it over a period of. For whom did Christ do his cross work? And he definitely ref, uh, references uh, Grider and his Arminianism in the even uh, 
because he wrote an article for the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, which I happen to have here, Greider did, on Arminianism. So he's referencing that. And in response to Greider and his, uh, his, his, in his book on uh, the uh, a Wesleyan theology of sanctification, which is his uh, magnum opus, which should be somewhere here. No, I'm, I'm I can it in the house right now. Grider not only embraces the the uh, governmental th uh, theory, he vociferously slanderously rejects penal substitutionary atonement. He con consistently labels it as Calvinist. Calvinist, he's using that as a, as a derogative term. It's not Calvinist. It's much broader than Calvinist. It's historic Christian doctrine. You still see the remnants of it in the Catholic Mass. Why do the Mass? If you hold to the governmental theory, What's the purpose of, of the Lord's Supper? What's the purpose? To, to show forth that God uh, unjustly killed his own son for no reason other than to, dis, to show his anger at sin. Talk about kicking the dog, you know? This is not an appropriate parallel, but you know what I mean. Somebody gets angry, so they take it on their dog or their kids or something like that. That, that is the governmental view. It has no coherent biblical understanding of the cross. It has no consistency at all with Scripture. And, uh, and Grider re explicitly, vehemently, angrily, rejects penal substitution. See, that's worse than simply, oh, I, I prefer this other one, like Olson does, Roger Olson. I prefer this. Like, you get a choice. You either believe what God says or you don't. Olson's not particular about the Bible. I have to say that. Olson goes with what Olson wants to go with. Eh, not good. So also, also in response to, uh, let's see, where should I read here? Uh, Greider has this weird view that somehow actually paying the penalty for our sins is not, it is a lesser thing than simply forgiving them without dealing with the justice. Because, and Greider, I think that's why he denies that justice is part of the nature of God. You know, these things have, you know, if you have bad theology, it, it manifests itself in all kinds of ways. A bad view of God, or if you're not born again, that will manifest itself all over the place, too. Uh, so it says here, uh, perhaps this is a place to respond to one reason that which Greider Greider offers for the Arminian view. He informs us that Arminians, now, not all Arminians. Greider doesn't like that, but not all Arminians. He acknowledges that many Arminians hold to penal substitution. Feel that God the Father would not be forgiving us at all if his justice was satisfied by the real thing that justice needs, punishment. They understand that there can only be punishment or forgiveness, not both, in their understanding. Realizing, e.g., now this is a, a quote from Greider, that a child is either punished or forgiven. Yeah, this is, this is Greider. Not forgiven after the punishment has been meted out. That's not actually true. I have to, to, to wonder whether Greider was ever a parent. A parent, because you love your child, have to, you have to mete out punishment. 
And the punishment hurts you more than the co child because you know you have to protect them from themselves. They have to be disciplined so they don't continue to do foolish things and get themselves killed or imprisoned or what. They must learn. So, yeah, the idea that you can't for mix forgiveness with satisfying justice is absurd. Absurd! So, the one offended, can't he pay the debt of the offender? Isn't, doesn't that constitute forgiveness, too? Satisfying his, the, the debt out of his own pocket? Wouldn't that be forgiveness? I'm going to forgive your debt against me because I'm going to absorb the loss myself. I'm not going to require you to pay. Who's, who's, who's taking the penalty upon themselves? The debt. The person that forgives you, the debt. See, Griner's stupid. Morally stupid. Biblically stupid. What is wrong with you, man? Aren't born again or something? Yeah, yeah the, 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 the things of the Spirit are foolishness to the natural man. The cross is foolishness. As, as uh, Paul says, the, 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 cro the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that don't believe. To the Jews of stumbling blocks and to the Greeks, foolishness. Yeah. Foolishness to Grider. What does that tell you about Grider? Now, back to uh, to uh, Raymond here, Dr. Raymond, uh, Robert Raymond. But such of you, construing punishment and forgiveness as it does as incompatible antitheses, simply fails to recognize that in all true forgiveness... Human as well as divine. Now, I didn't read this before I talked about this yesterday. It's just obvious. I just saw this. And, oh, yeah, so we got somebody, Dr. Uh, Robert Raymond, that agrees with me. <laughs> he agrees with God. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the, I'm not important. Simply fails to recognize that all true forgiveness, human as well as divine, the offended party... In all true forgiveness, the offended party is vicariously bearing in himself the offense of and the punishment due to the offending part uh, to the offending party. Yes, when somebody, and this is we're talking about God sin against God, but when somebody has done something to you and you forgive them, you are bearing the offense in yourself. You are letting it go. You are bearing the cost. If you forgive a debt, you are bearing the cost of that in yourself. You are foregoing what is owed you. This is pretty simple, right? He's just saying it much more clearly than I do. To use Grinder's illustration, when a parent truly forgives his repentant child and does not inflict judicial punishment upon him, well, if he inflicted judicial punishment, sometimes that would mean executing your child. You know? Or actually, you don't do it. You take it before the elders in the city, and they stone the child to death. This is probably like older children, recalcitrant children. Rebels, drunkards, a child that is a drunkard. Uh, so, yeah, this is an older child. Uh, yeah. You know, they're children like that. They're just absolutely implacable, just wicked. And that's why they're to be, they were to be put to death publicly by the community. That's, that is a, a pedagogical device, an educational device. You know, public hangings had an educational benefit. You do that, and this is what happens to you, as long as you don't hang innocent people. A parent who truly forgives his repentant child and does not inflict judicial punishment upon him 
What is taking place is this. The parent is vicariously bearing in himself both the child's offense against him and the punishment which is the child's, uh, the child's offense deserves. The parent's vicarious sin-bearing becomes precisely the grounds upon which he may justly extend forgiveness to his child. If I were to forgive somebody's monetary debt they owe me, and I say, I'm canceling your debt. You don't owe me anything anymore. I am bearing the cost, the, 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 the non-payment of a legitimate debt to me in myself, and I am setting them free from that obligation. I bear the cost... And I freely, having done that, set them free. And I can say, you don't owe me anything anymore. But I'm bearing the cost. Right? Well, the offense is against God. So contrary to the Jehovah's Witnesses that say God uh, incarnated Michael the archangel as Jesus, and then Jesus died on the cross, which doesn't make sense because... Michael, the archangel, the offenses aren't against him, they're against God. Only God could bear the penalty. You have to have a divine Savior. Wow, that just came out. <laughs> just the logic of God here, that you have to have a divine. It is God who must be on the cross bearing our sins because he is the offended party. Jesus is not a stranger that is being executed in our place. He is God who is dying in our place. The man God, who is both man and God. It is absolutely necessary because God is the offended one. God must forgive. God must satisfy his own justice to do it. The parent's vicarious uh, sin-bearing becomes precisely the grounds in which he may extend justly extend forgiveness to the child. Yes, because he has taken the punishment upon himself. He has foregone for, uh, what he deserves. What he deserves from the child. He, uh, 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 there is a justice that he deserves to have executed on the child. And when he foregoes that, he is foregoing something that is due him because a child has sinned against him. I'm going to use sin there in quotes because really sin is always against God, not against man. There's a debt the child has. He's not rendered his parents what they deserve. So when they forgive that, they are giving up that thing. They're setting it aside. What it, the, the, the honor and respect and the obedience that, is deser that they deserve, they are letting, let, putting that penalty aside and bearing the offense on themselves. They're allowing it to, to, to go, to let it go. But they bear that. That's what Raymond is saying, correctly so. Similarly, similar, similarly, in the case of divine forgiveness, Christ, who is not a disinterested third party, but as the Son of God was himself the offended party, along with the entire Godhead, amen, bore in himself both the offense and the punishment of those to whom the Father gave to him. Here's why, now, Raymond is holding to a, 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 probably a particular redemption here, but that's really beside the point. 
his vicarious sin-bearing becoming precisely the grounds upon which the Godhead may justly extend forgiveness to those for whom Christ died. All right? So, but even if you can extend this to an unlimited atonement because it's still, the, the forgiveness is extended to those who believe in Christ. But Christ, may, uh, his atonement is uh, sufficient, to use the Calvinist term, f sufficient for all, but effective, effectual, only to believers. There's no barrier there. I say, well, I can't be saved because Christ didn't die for me. Yes, he did. But it's only, going to, it's only going to be effective for you if you believe. Salvation is by the grace of God through faith in Christ. There, you have to have the faith in there. God ordained the faith. And one could say God gives the faith. I certainly know that the faith that I had when I believed on Christ did not come from me. It did not come from me. I had a faith I did not have five seconds prior to that. It had a faith with a content, and that content was Christ died for my sins. And because of that, I, and that alone, I was right with God. That was the content of saving faith that God gave me. That was his revelation to me that Christ died for my sins. It wasn't some preacher telling me this. I was on my knees next to my cot in the barracks in Minot Air Force Base in the year 1976, near my birthday, about September, 46 years ago and counting. So his vicarious suffering, see, this can extend, it doesn't have to be particular because his vicarious suffering provides the grounds for forgiveness. Now, you can have grounds, an unbeliever can have the grounds for forgiveness without having the forgiveness if he does not believe. So you can have a universal atonement without a universal salvation. Because God requires faith. The, 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 fact, the fact that the atonement is universal does not necessarily lead to universal salvation because it, it of itself does not save. It is simply the grounds of salvation. Because there's a relationship that must come about between the sinner and the Lord. There must be saving faith. Those that don't believe, what? The wrath of God abides on them in spite of the atonement. Also, last paragraph here in this section on government, uh, the, the governmental view of the atonement in uh, Rod, uh, Raymond, what was his first name? Is it Roger? Robert. Robert Raymond. Also in response to Grider, if Christ's death upon the cross was not intended as a sin offering to pay the penalty for anyone's sin, but only intended rather by whatever motive, emotive power it may exert to illustrate to men what their sins uh, penally deserve at the hands of a just God, comma. See, that's the governmental view. The, the payment isn't actually for sins. It doesn't actually the punishment. But it's simply a demonstration of God's 
anger at sin. I don't understand how it can be a demonstration of God's righteous anger at sin because a, an innocent man is being put to death. How is that a demonstration of God's righteous anger? No, that's unrighteous anger. Oh, this is so moronic. Then not only is no man's sin atoned for, yeah, if Christ didn't die in, uh, uh, to take the punishment for our sins, there is no atonement. There is no grounds for God's forgiveness. There is no salvation. You are still in your sins. For yet, but also Christ's death is rendered useless. Amen to that. For it is simply not the case that sinful men conclude from his death that forgiveness is costly. So sinners aren't going to get the right idea if Christ put an innocent man to death, right? Exactly. But that they should strive to cease from anarchy in the world God governs. In other words, that the answer to sin is uh, uh, striving to keep the law. Now, see, the, the governmental theory is anti-cross. It is anti-Christ. So where does the governmental theory come from then? The pits of hell. It nullifies the cross. It is saying you don't need an atonement. You don't need a substitutionary atonement. You don't need a sin bearer. All you need to do is work harder. God takes sin seriously, so you have to strive after holiness. Man-made, self-made righteousness. Well, we know how far that got the Pharisees. Yeah, Raymond is right on. Right on. Right in that par those paragraph there. It's absolutely correct. So if you want to, to choose the uh, to believe in a God who uh, executes his son to put on a demonstration, just realize that uh, you're basically trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't know how else you could interpret it. You're despising what Christ did. I mean, the Bible's not unclear on this. The Bible repeatedly says that Christ died for us. The, the Greek word there is, is huper. It means for us, on our behalf. There's no, nothing unclear about this. The only reason people would not believe in the cross is because they're not saved. They don't like the ideas. They reject the gospel because this is a rejection of the gospel. It is that serious. It is rejection of Christ and his death. And what does the resurrection mean? See, the resurrection is not only the evidence of who Christ is, but the evidence that Christ actually atoned for our sins because if our sins were imputed to him and he did not make a full atonement, he could not rise from the death, from the dead because he would still be bearing sin. See, the danger of being the sin bearer is if you don't fully atone for it, you don't get up, get up out of the grave. Do you understand that? The fact that he rose proves that he paid the penalty. It's something to be happy about. But if you want to believe in the governmental thing, what do you got? you got nothing, nothing but your own righteousness, which will not get you very far, Jesus said. Oh, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not, did we not this build this church for you? Did I not build this mighty holiness denomination? Did we not strive after holiness, our holiness, to please you? The Lord will say, depart from me. 
I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. See, our personal holiness can never be enough to satisfy God because it doesn't atone for anything. If we lived a perfect life, if we sinned one time and spent the rest of our days living in perfect obedience, we would still be condemned as sinners because we would have the guilt of that sin on us. Obedience is only what is required. That's why Jesus said, Confess, I am nothing but an unworthy servant when you have done all, for I have only done what I ought to have done. If the requirements, if what we ought to do is to keep the law, what we ought to do is love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our uh, strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself, how can we have any merit? Because how can you do anything more than that? There is no merit. There is no excess merit in obedience because obedience is simply what's required. There is no super uh, erogatory works that go beyond what God requires. It's impossible because God requires perfection. You have to have a perfect offering. Christ, who has a death he did not owe. You have to have a perfect man dying and then in being united to him, you share in his death that applies to you also, and you share in his resurrection. It's like a wedding, an old-fashioned wedding under old-fashioned law. A man marries a woman. He brings his assets and his liabilities, and she brings her assets and her liabilities, and the two become one, legally one, which is why, historically, a wife cannot re be required to testify against her husband because you not, can't be required to testify against yourself, at least once upon a time in America. Legally won. So what does he bring? Christ brings his assets, all that he possesses, including a death he paid for a debt he didn't owe. And his wife brings her assets, which are nothing but rags, and a penalty of death, a sentence of death on her head. And when the two come together, her debt is paid because the two have become one, one spirit. According to Scripture, that's how it works. No other theory of atonement, the penal substitutionary is not a theory, it's what the Bible reveals, can account for what the Bible says. And it can't possibly pay the penalty for our sins. Christ has to pay that penalty. And he's done that at Calvary 2,000 years ago. He said, it is finished. It is complete. He took our sins, the indictments against us, and nailed them to that cross. And wrote, it is paid with his own blood. So if somebody tries to sell you something else, don't buy it. Christ is your only salvation. He is your only hope. Trust in him. He purchased salvation for you. 